for example, where you teach, and was very passionate uh, when he spoke about the state of Indian democracy, and yet you were disappointed that he didn't really offer people a roadmap of, okay, what is he going to do, or what is the Congress going to do uh, to, to respect these institutions, to restore them you know, to, to what they once were. Maybe we were never perfect institutionally, but we were not in the situation that we are in today. Um, is it fair to put it on the opposition, uh, to, to put that burden on the opposition in a sense, when this hasn't come from them? Sure, I mean, I, I completely agree. Uh, in my defense, that little bit about Rahul Gandhi comes to the very end, whereas a large part of the start is, you know, talking about the sorts of decays that you mentioned. But I, I do think the opposition has a role. Of course, the opposition has a role. And one of the reasons I was really disappointed with that talk was everything was about going back. What we've done in the past, the sort of legacy we carry, uh, poverty reduction, going back. And those are important things, of course. But what's, what's going to happen with the future? Uh, talking about employment is not enough at a time when you have artificial intelligence, which will change the way the world of work is going to appear to us. So you have to think creatively about what's going to come next, not harp on bringing back or restoring the past. And I think some of us wanted that vision, a forward-looking vision, uh, not hackneyed promises that people have heard in the past, but something new, something different. And I think when we think about hope, hope is not just passively waiting for someone to deliver you, but actively thinking about what next. And in that sense, I think Indian citizens have sort of outstripped both government and opposition in terms of thinking about what they want next. Um, I was, for those reasons, extremely disappointed. Yeah, I do want to take that up, Nithi. I mean, uh, I enjoyed Induji's book entirely, though I think in that particular segment and the conclusions he's drawn from it, I think reveal the limitations of drawing rather big conclusions from a series of speeches in England. I mean, the fact is there is action happening in India that Indrajit, I think, was not aware of. For example, on the CAA, I don't want to diminish in any way the extraordinary efforts of the ordinary protesters right across the country. I mean, starting with Shaheen Bagh, and I'm proud to have been the first politician to have gone to Shaheen Bagh and addressed the, the, the grandmothers and all the others who were there. Uh, and I have no regrets about that. But equally, uh, obviously, there were office goers in every city in India who came out. But what Indrajit is not aware, for example, is that the Congress Party actually did conduct its own protests against the CEA throughout the country. I personally inaugurated and addressed seven such protests in my state of Kerala in seven different cities. So it's not that the, 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 the opposition was sort of absent without leave from these issues. That I represent, which is the media, this institutional decay, how <coughs> serious do you think that is in terms of India's de democratic future? Extremely, because I think one of the important efforts of successive governments in the first six and a half decades after independence was in building up these institutions to give them the kind of credibility and the kind of value that would make democracy entrenched, not only structurally, but in the habits and expectations of the people. Uh, you talked about elections in your first question, Nidhi. There's no doubt that um, this is... The one saving grace, if you like, and yet you've got the respected VDEM Institute in Sweden, the Varieties <laughs> of Democracy Institute, deciding to call us not a democracy anymore, but an electoral autocracy. That is, that we elect our leaders, but then they behave them behave like autocrats. And um, I'm reminded of Jay Prakash Narayan when he first quit electoral politics in the early 1950s, saying that he did so because he feared that elections would be would amount to a bunch of sheep electing their shepherd who would essentially then push them around and his prophecy sadly has come true in many ways today so we we, are, we have to accept that elections alone are not enough the institutions are what give body and strength to our democracy whether it's parliament whether it's an independent election commission that is immune to governmental influence whether it's the new, cre newly created institutions like the Information Commission after the passage of the Right to Information Act, or the old institutions like the Reserve Bank of India, which was supposed to be statutorily independent of government policy, all of these institutions have found their independence vitiated. And now we're seeing the government being quite shameless about misusing even those institutions that are directly under it, but were meant to have a certain amount of independence 
like the Enforcement Directorate and the CBI and the other law enforcement bodies, because they were meant to chase wrongdoers without fear or favor, they're now being unleashed selectively only on those whom the BJP, the ruling party, deems to be its political opponents. So given that, we are looking at a, at a genuine crisis of democratic institutions in our country. Uh, all of these institutions that I mentioned and more have been undermined either in their functioning or in their appointment and their terms of service or in the ways in which the government has, has tended to use them or not allow them to be used. But can I just follow up on that? Uh, back to you, Shashi Tharoor, which is that, okay, I think all governments have a tendency to want to control the narrative or, or spin things their own way or, or generally you know, con control the way things are going, right? Governments have a tendency to do that even in democracies. But then we were supposed to have checks and balances. And the media and the judiciary were an important part of that institutionally. I could have a separate discussion with you on what's happened to the media, but the judiciary in particular, as a citizen, I am outraged by how it has let us down, right up to the Supreme Court, where a bail plea of an Omar Khalid gets adjourned now 13 times, and he has spent years in jail without trial. So where do we, where do we turn to? Which institution do we go to for relief? It certainly seems that way in a large number of cases and the sense that the judiciary only seems to show courage on issues which doesn't matter, which don't matter very much to the government. And on other matters, they will, they will, they will be a little more quiescent, but uh, the media is no exception. Is he? You won't be neither cajoled or cudgeled into seeing the merits of the government's point of view on every issue. That's and why I left. We're not, not you, not you, the, the profession as a whole. You've been cudgeled a bit, but you haven't been, you haven't been cajoled. Uh, having said that, you also have a situation where, where the media isn't directly uh, in a position to support a government narrative, it instead plays the role of serving as a weapon of mass distraction. Something is going wrong that can't be hidden. What you do instead is you build up a narrative about a totally trivial a side story that dominates all the headlines and diverts the attention of the public from the real failure of the government on a particular issue. It's been working extremely well for the government. I'm, I'm not at all surprised that they are seen as dominating the narrative in these circumstances. But you know, uh, Indrajit Roy, in the book you have written extensively about and you've documented the kind of resistance uh, from citizens, uh, when it, whether it's you know farmer protests or, uh, or, or Dalits or uh, protests against the Citizenship Amendment Act. And just to be the devil's advocate here, is there a risk of romanticizing these protests? And I, and I say this because if you look at even the CAA protests, young students you know, who, who thought that they were standing up for what was right ended up being thrown behind bars under the, uh, this draconian anti-terror law called the UAPA, where you don't get bail for years if you do get bail, right? So they've paid a very heavy price uh, for, for, for you know, these protests. So is there a danger of romanticizing protest in India today? Absolutely. I mean, I would not want this work to be read as romanticizing protests. But I would say it's better to romanticize protest than romanticize the government, which is the tendency in a lot of our institutions that you've uh, you know, talked about. Um, these students knew what they were getting into and they went ahead and I think we need to appreciate their bravery, their courage, knowing what they were up against. And of course, in some cases, these uh, sort of laws were thrown against them. Uh, they didn't know the severity of things, maybe. But we should not undermine their agency in willing to in be willing to take on a government when every other institution had failed them, as you've pointed out. So I think there is something to be said about not romanticizing protests. But I think we also need to appreciate and understand that the protesters are just fed up with what's going on. The protesters know that the institutions, including with respect, some of the political parties that should be acting as the opposition, uh, aren't clearly up to the task. So they want to take this. No, uh, so to follow up on that, uh, one of the interesting things